Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. This is your newest segment of Word on the Street. I am joined here today by Casey Brindley. He's the general manager of Roush Honda out in Westerville, Ohio. Casey, how you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Of course, my pleasure. Again, I mentioned before the call started that when we started doing these, you were one of the first guys I pegged that we had to get on here. So I'm very excited to have you here. Um, so we were just talking before uh, about Labor Day. So how was it this year for you? You told me you had a little bit of like an internal competition. Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, we had a great Labor Day. Uh, we, uh, we opened the store. Uh, traditionally, we're, we're open Monday through Saturday and close our store every Sunday uh, for Memorial Day and Labor Day weekends. Uh, we started about five or six years ago opening on Sunday, Monday. And uh, we, we work uh, like a 12 to 6 type of schedule. And just the sales team comes in and normally half our staff works the Memorial Day weekend and the other half takes the two days off and then we flip it around and the other, the other team does the Labor Day. So we have kind of an internal competition uh, between the two teams as to who's going to edge them out. So the, uh, the, the weekend results were great. And uh, fortunately, uh, we, we sold a bunch of cars and the Memorial Day team actually did edge them out by one car. One oh car goodness. they beat them by, but... Uh, but not a bad ratio when you're talking about, you know, 20, 25, 24 cars, that type of deal. So No, that's not bad at all. I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge day. So congrats for that. Um, what was your expectations going into this holiday with like COVID going on and sure. you know, everything else that's happening? Uh, we're really lucky in the area that we are in in the country, in central Ohio, we're really, really lucky to, to be a part of um, – you know, the, the market kind of surging rather than regressing. It, it's really been, um, it's been an aggressive market ever since May. And obviously March and April, both of those months are, you know, you look back on those months always forever, I think, as, as really difficult, challenging times. And, uh, and I think that a lot of the work that we did internally during those two months really kind of prepared us for the takeoff in May. And we've just been fortunate, been one of those markets that's really, really uh, done very well over the last three months. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to, you know, continue to push ourselves through those three months. So our expectations are sky high right now. I mean, our expectations for September are to beat September of 19. Uh, our expectations for the fourth quarter are to be, you know, Quarter four of 2019 was one of our better quarters we've ever had. So, um, you know, we, we, we're just kind of going with the flow and, and hopefully the, 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 the consumer confidence continues, which I think a lot of it has to do with consumer confidence. But mm -hmm. I also think a lot of the dealership success right now has to do with the dealerships that are very tuned in and engaged with the customer experience becoming more customer friendly and customer service oriented with the way you set up your website, the way that your sales team communicates with customers, you know, the, the days of, you know, just going to the dealership and browsing for a car. I, I don't know if we'll ever see those days again. Um, so I think that there's a, a lot of kudos to the, 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 uh, the industry as a whole for evolving. You know, I think all of us have had go, to go through that. Um, and I think that there's a, you know, it's not easy to redefine your business model. You know, certainly just midstream because of a pandemic. And I think a, a lot of dealerships have done a really good job at that. And Honda was one of the first brands that we were looking at the responses from each of the OEMs. They, they were right there uh, with getting the good information out, letting people know about sanitation. I mean, they were very quick to respond. Yeah. I think it helped in a lot of ways that Honda has always been a more consumer friendly brand. I mean, yeah. they're not like a BMW or a, you know, an Acura, even if that's a sister company to Honda sure. where it's, they had that almost like too cool for school vibe going sure. on. Sure. This is your mom and pop, you know, come by your, you know, your minivan kind of a, a differentiating. And that I think that really helped them. A major market driven yeah. brand. And That's a better way to put it than I did. With cars, uh, some, of the, some of the premium brands don't have as much of that. Uh, from the outside looking in, they may not have as much of that sense. Um, 
I've been a part of enough of those stores as a consumer and a friend of people that worked at some of those stores to, to know very well that beyond those walls, it's not that way. But um, yeah, it, it, we're just, we felt very fortunate to be partnered with Honda going through this because of the level of communication. Um, you know, one thing when everything started to go, you know, in a negative direction, obviously they halted production uh, and manufacturing when they said, Hey, we're going to go back live. I mean, they, they came back, uh, you know, within, within days, all of a sudden it, everything got turned back on. We started getting cars again. So they've been great, great to work with, with that regard. And I'm assuming there's no plans as of right now to halt that again. Right. No, nothing that I'm aware of. I mean, Honda, you know, continues to announce different things. Um, but right now, as of the last allocation, they, they were going to produce 100% of, you know, the intended amount. So that's awesome. I mean, yeah. that's a great response as long as people stay safe and happy and healthy. But it's, it's nice to see the return be triumphant in a lot of ways where a couple of the dealers that I've spoken to in the last couple of months I said, I'm doing way better than I did in 2019 or 2018. Um, and I think for a store like yourself, whose web presence was always really good, you have great content on there, which I want to touch on a couple of those pieces later. Uh, I think that really helped you also transition. So was there anything in the store that you felt like had prepared you differently for this new norm? Yeah, you know, one of the things that definitely prepared us was over the, the course of the last 18 months, um, actually when we made the transition to, to Fusion Zone uh, for, for a website provider, I, I got very involved at that point in the entire digital experience for the customers and really helped connect some dots from how we went to market in the store and on the showroom on the lot and really connected that with our digital audience. Obviously, I'm, I'm a car guy, so doing any of the creative or anything like that is not my wheelhouse, but I was able to portray a lot of things to uh, different team members that were really able to help us get that kind of going. And then taking you know our pricing strategy, the way that we try to communicate pricing with customers, we've got a model we've had for a long time, give customers good information, they'll make good decisions. So we try, um, you know, we don't hide a lot of things. Uh, we're very, you know, transparent is kind of the, the, uh, the, the it word right now in the industry. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of just always been our model. We've always like every customer gets a proposal. I mean, back to the stories that my dad told me about when he was selling cars here in the 80s, every customer got a printed proposal. So that's just always how we've done things. And just transitioning that a little bit to the digital and, and actually finding out how easy that was uh, really helped us get prepared. And then, you know, just working through, you know, good times and bad over the last year. 2019 had some of its challenging months for us. Uh, early going of 2019 was definitely challenging for us. And uh, we had a really good year overall, but we, we, were, we, we started really battling in the second quarter and, uh, and just overall worked on ourselves and got a lot better, I think, which we look back on and feel very blessed in regards to the fact that we went through a little bit of our own hardship last year. And then this year, obviously, took care of itself. We didn't have to be hard on ourselves this year. I think you, you hit something there that's so important, too, which is you guys have been doing this from the 80s. I yeah. mean, you have that cred people have gone to your store and let's say parents have gone to your store and they've had that same experience that when they have their kids coming up and they're going off to college or they're ready to move out on their own or just getting their first car in high school, they point you guys to you because you know, they, you're the same. It's not like you used to be the shady dealer down the street. Sure. And then now you're like, Oh, look how transparent we are. Correct. Or, Correct. Customers see through that too. I mean, totally you know, know. Customer, customers, customers know. I mean, they know when you're, you've got a great marketing agency that says how transparent you are. And then they go into your store and your guys are like, I mean, they, they know. Yeah, of course. And so you got to kind of walk the talk. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of the backwards, you know, you got to, got to make sure that the, uh, the, the dogs wagging the tail, not the other way around. 
And it's so important that your website is the same thing. Cause if you go to your website and you have all these like pay to play walls up in these form submissions yeah. and then you go in the store and it's completely easy going, you just like talk to them and try to get them the car. People are going to be like, what, what is the difference here? Like, why, why am I getting this one experience or the opposite where the website's super transparent and the store is all, you know, like brick and, or uh, red tape, right. you know, Right. Those have to be married. If you're going to be one way, at least be that way all the way through. Because yep. at least a customer can say, well, you know what you're getting into. You, you can, you're, you're at least being honest with it. Yeah. Um, I have the credit of a friend of mine for that. He's who helped me with that, um, that idea originally. His name's Ian Ish. He works for Edmonds. And Ian used to serve our account. Um, he told me a long time ago, I was walking him out after one of our monthly reviews and walking him to the front door. And he just turned around and told me, he said, you know, your store is one of my favorite stores to go into because you guys always make me feel so welcome. And he said, if you could ever figure out a way to show your customers on your website, how I feel when I walk in here, you'll, you, you would be on to something. And I never forgot that. And then, that was like three years ago. And then I, you know, I, I was a big part of the, the website change and, you know, uh, that was something that I always kept in mind. So even on our website in the background, the videographer has a, you know, uh, us opening the front door and everything. It's kind of a, a welcoming, you know, it's a backdrop. So it's not, you know, we know customers are there to find a car. So that's the most important part, but we also want them to feel great while they're going through that experience, whether they come through our front door or they're looking on our website. And I think that subliminal video is so important in a way to set the tone for the site. Uh, a it. lot of dealerships like this do that, you know, 30,000 view up of like, look how big our lot is. Yeah. Look how awesome we are. Like, nobody cares. They're going to buy the same city that you're going to buy from a ton of places. Customers how are you going to not care? Oh, sorry? Customers normally do not care. You're correct. They do not care right. about the fact that you have 600 cars in stock because all they need is that one silver ex that they want right so, so it's about what are you going to do for me today how how are you going to end up closing this deal um something that i uh, i want to actually touch on this first before we go deeper i want to know a little bit more about you because i've been talking to you for quite some time but i don't we couldn't really have that bonding which is how did you sure. get started at rock Rush? Okay, so I mentioned my dad. So my dad is uh, the president uh, and CEO of our company. And uh, we also have a, a Ford dealership on the west side of Columbus. Um, my dad started selling cars here at Rosh um, in like 1983. I was born in 84. And so I grew up around the dealership. My dad uh, was the new car manager and the general manager of the store. Um, so he's really been the, the face to the store for close to 30 years now. And, uh, and so it's just something that I grew up around here, you know, uh, mom would bring me and my brother in and we would go to lunch with dad once a month. And, you know, back in school, they had take your kid to work day. So, you know, I would all saddle up and come into the dealership. So then my first job here, of course, in high school, uh, was to change oil and park cars and wash cars. Uh, so I did that for about a year and a half, uh, while I started in college. Then I went out West, to uh, Arizona State, got my degree out there in business and psychology, got one of those interdisciplinary degrees, which is kind of like marrying two different concepts, which was interesting. And then I came back, I, I started selling cars uh, for Honda Superstition Springs, a really nice guy named Chris Zamora gave me a job uh, selling cars on the weekends. So I, uh, I worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, open and close there for him uh, for about six months and really fell in love with you know, selling cars and knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I graduated, got in the car the next day and drove home and started here a, a month later. So I sold cars for five years. And then, uh, and then after a short hiatus away from the dealership, I came back and uh, got into uh, management and started as an assistant manager in the new car department, then new car manager about a year later. And then, uh, then general sales manager, uh, three years ago and general manager started about a year ago. That's awesome. Uh, I think it's really interesting that you were changing oil and you worked your way up and caught the see from a ground level what the day-to-day -day is like. 
has that shaped any of your perspective on oh yeah purpose? absolutely i think that uh you, you've got you've got one of two one of two people uh who come up you know as, as a family member of, of a dealer all right and a lot of times that's an owner we're actually an employee-owned company so uh, we're a little bit unique in that regards but uh, most dealers, children come up in one of two ways, and that's either, you know, uh, come up the hard way or kind of the easy way. And I certainly, you know, uh, had the same experience at work that I had at home. So. Gotcha. Do you feel like it was important to do the work from the t bottom up and does your like sales team have to do kind of the same? Do they have to do any like cross train to know how they, that works? That's definitely one of my dad's philosophies. Uh, one of the things that he believes in is never ask somebody to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. And you have to make sure that people see you doing those things pretty frequently, uh, especially from, you know, from his view over the last, you know, uh, 20 to 30 years, sometimes he wasn't working uh, in the service drive, but he needed to be able to walk by and notice, you know, trash on the ground and, and go over and pick it up and then be able to see one of our porters, for instance, who's moving cars and stuff. Well, who's got a better opportunity to pick up the trash and get it where it needs to go? You know, somebody who's working outside in the drive moving cars all day long or the guy who's coming and going, you know, once or twice a day. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a good foundation built there of, you know, everybody kind of having a little bit of stake here and, and doing what we needed to do and, you know, we talk about it all the time. Just treat this place like it's your house. You wouldn't walk by a piece of trash, you know, on the ground at your house. I mean, you pick it up and get rid of it, right? So we kind of, kind of use that same philosophy. That's awesome. Um, I noticed when I was doing a little bit of research on your store that two hours away from you, there's also a Rick Roush in Medina. Yeah. Is that yeah. really, is that related or is that just coincidental? No, nope. nope. it's it's just coincidental. Wow. I was, if I had to put my money chips, I was like, okay, that's gotta be like a sister store or something. Sure. What's the difficulties of branding? Cause they're two hours away, about a hundred miles, which is far enough for most consumers, but for like digital, that's, that's like on top of each other in a lot of Correct. ways. Correct. Yeah. We're, um, it, we're, we're really lucky in two ways. Number one, um, they've got an outstanding following. And our phone still to this day rings. It rings less now than it used to, but it still rings at least at least a handful of times a week with someone looking for Rick Roush Honda, not Roush Honda. And uh, we used to actually have on all our operators stands, we used to always have the phone number so we could give it to a customer because we got so many of those calls. You know, rather than, that was back before you could just Google everything right away, you know, I mean, you're still working sure. on sheets and phone books and, but, um, but the other thing is that um, we, we, uh, we, we've done a good job at marketing ourselves in regards to, you know, the volume that we do. And, and, and one of the things that, uh, that, that there's, there's not a whole lot of geographic difference, but there's a lot of inventory difference. So a ton of times where, you know, a customer may find a car or whatever, they're seeing our overlay, they're seeing the phone number, you know, we've got our call tracking numbers set up that come in. So we can see right where the call comes through and it, there's not as much of that uh, repurposing between the two dealerships anymore. That's good. Cause that's something that I, if I was doing SEO on a brand new site and you were saying, okay, we, we're just launching a new business, Rick Roush or, or Roush Honda. What's the biggest thing that's going to be the biggest thing to get over is yeah. separating that out. But the good thing is whenever I do like a Google search for your store's name, they come up like the 10th, right? Because yeah. you're close enough that they're going to kind of assume there's some sort of similarity between the two. But it's awesome that you, I mean, you dominate the Google My Business. You have all your listings. All of your review sites are for your own, uh, which is, again, great because, oh, I can't imagine the headache of having to train a new salesperson. Like, no, 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 you got to make sure they have our phone number because if they right. don't, they're going to call the other guy. I'm like, wait, I had to drive two hours now? Okay. Uh, um, I did want to talk to you a little bit about call tracking because I saw you're using car wars. Uh, is that still the case? We were, we're not anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, who yeah. are you using now? Um, uh, we're using, a, um, we're using a company that's, that's tied to our internal like phone network. 
And, uh, and it's just something that on our end of things, we weren't getting the usability out of the, the car wars tool. And uh, so it just caused us to, you know, we already had that built in system that we're paying for for our phones anyway. So we just started, we just kicked back to using that. And it's just kind of one of those things where we're big about expense control and, you know, we're all good with the expense as long as we're optimizing and getting that return. Uh, and sometimes when we don't feel we're getting that return, we really, you know, we're very diligent to make sure that we are using everything properly. And we went through a process of, gosh, it was four months of really vetting hard on our end to, to see if we were maximizing that partnership. And we found that we were, and really the tool just wasn't for us. What was the setup period between the two? Was there a big handoff or was it pretty easy to go from one to the other? You know, uh, it was more difficult than what it was originally explained, um, like a lot of things. But on our end of things, um, the experience was positive uh, with the beginning, um, not as positive with the end. Uh, we were hoping to be able to continue that partnership and it just didn't make sense, but um, but that's okay. Sometimes those things aren't gonna last and that's all right. I am a big believer though in call tracking. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful way to see through some of the, you know, we get very focused on our CRM lead source report and we get very focused on our conversion report. Um, I think that it's a really clean way just to see how many times did your phone ring from that source. And if you're pulling it in your CRM correct, you can see how many times those turn into guardians. You want to talk about training a new salesperson in a positive way. You train them how to answer a phone call properly, how to get customers information and how to give customers all the information they want. And then show them that every eighth time that they answer one of those phone calls, it's going to be a sale for them. Holy cow. How does that factor into your trade? Like I know you mentioned that that's part of your training is to get them, you know, phone certified, if you will, to be able to answer it correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Do you use any of the call tracking recordings to show your, you know, salespeople? No, no. And you know why? Just because there's not enough time. There's just never, you know, we could make that time, but at the end of the day, that's one of those wonderful concepts that on paper, it looks great. And you, you know, you're like, yes, I will absolutely use this. Oh my gosh. I'll sit them down right here. We'll go over it. And it's just not realistic, but Back to when I was talking earlier about give customers good information, they'll make good decisions, right? So if we don't train a salesperson how to answer the phone properly, and let's even go further than that. If we don't train our receptionists who answer the phone, because we don't have dedicated operators anymore. Um, that was a function that we used to have. We, we went away from it. We have, we have uh, welcome receptionists in, in the three sales departments. And they actually optimize phones as well. Um, but they're not just on the phones all the time. We did a better job of getting all our calls separated to, to better groups. And we did a better job of kind of working with teams to have those set up so that if someone didn't answer it, it went to the next person instead of the phone just keeps ringing. Definitely something to look into um, for, for lots of dealerships. Great opportunity there to improve your customer service. But um, if we train the operator how to answer the call properly, the way we want it to be answered, the way that we would envision the best customer service, and then a warm transfer to a salesperson who can actually take the call rather than just put it into the queue and let some salesperson answer it or not answer it. The worst thing that happens is a salesperson has got a customer at their desk, gets interrupted, they answer the call, they're short with a brand new customer on the phone, and they're you know, they're, maybe they excuse themselves from the conversation with the sale, with the customer at their desk, but maybe not. So, it, you know, there's some great opportunities there just to train the way you want to have it done, the way it should look. And then, yeah, I mean, you can, you can record calls and listen to them and do some coaching opportunities if you've got the time. But if you just do a good job of teaching that, and then all you got to do is audit it once or twice. I, mean, I walked through our parts department earlier, audited, you know, the way a guy who's worked for us for 22 years and he's answering the phone and I literally was like stopped on a dime and walked over and made a note to the desk next to him and wrote out like real quick our script, like, 
you know, you don't answer the phone that way. This is, this is how we answer the phone. And it's not something new. It's not something he's never been taught, but you know, maybe we haven't talked about it recently enough, you know, but if you do think, if you do things with the right intention in mind, then you don't have to use all these fancy tools to coach it as much. Sometimes you won't have time to use those fancy tools. So you got to teach people, empower them to do the job the right way, and then just engage enough to hold them accountable to do it. Just keep it up, you know, keep it up to the standard. Simplicity and, and consistency wins every yeah. time. Keep it yeah. simple because people are busy. Like you said, they're running around. Uh, I th- one thing you said there that I thought was particularly important is not just having your salespeople trained to have that customer, you know, cadence that you were aiming for. Your operators, the, even just the people connecting your phones, if they aren't friendly, if they aren't nice, if they aren't at least a little bit knowledgeable of where things go, that could really set these micro moments up for a poor sales call later, a poor follow up call. Because when they hand it over, you're already grumpy. It's why everybody hates those uh, automated dialing systems when you dial in, because you're already grumpy by the time you get to talk to somebody who's just trying to help you with your problem. Hey, my router's not working. I need help with this. Well, I spent 20 minutes trying to press five to get to the right person that by the time I get to you, I'm already done with this company. Uh, I think that's... I mean, we've all gone through those experiences. So why would you set your place of business up to be that way? I couldn't agree more. (laughs) I think a lot of your um, focus on customer satisfaction is evident and shows up in dividends when you look at your reviews. That was one of the biggest things that I saw that was a huge difference maker between your store and a lot of other ones. Obviously, your Google My Business reviews are you have tons of them. They're great. You have a 4.5 thousand plus reviews. Awesome. The thing that I saw that I think your store does a little bit differently than all others is how much emphasis you put on third party reviews like Bueller Raider, Auto Trader, Auto.com, Car Gurus. Um, if you go on uh, uh, Roush Honda at the very top, you'll see those banners that you have, those uh, you know, awards that they've given you over the years. How has that relationship, how did it get started? How do you maintain it? Do you have to do a lot of work? Or does dealer reader reach out to you and say, we want to do these things? No, um, that's something that, uh, that we really work on um, internally. What we, what we really believe in is that uh, we believe in, in serving the customers and doing a great job for the customer. What we found is that uh, reviews are a great way to show customers that may not have worked with you and had that great experience since their dad or mom bought a car from you or their grandma or grandpa bought a car from you since the eighties, right? It's a great way to kind of connect some of those dots and customers who maybe are looking for a Honda for the first time in their lives. Maybe they just jump on and they see a couple of reviews. Like one thing that uh, like my dad reads every single review every single one and i mean he he loves them and i mean he does a great job of using them on the negative ones too in a coaching manner right but uh, but one of the things that he really emphasizes is when a customer um writes something about the way we made them feel right five star reviews are great partnerships with you know car gurus reviews are awesome Edmonds reviews are great Dealerator reviews is definitely something that I think is great. One of the things that we really enjoyed about the Dealerator review was it was more personalized toward the salesperson. You could ping the salesperson or the sales manager or the finance manager. So that really, like our team really got a lot of oomph out of that. You know, they got their pictures set. We got their pictures on there. We did a little profile form, did a little bio. Um, So there's benefit there. But at the end of the day, when the customer writes something about the way we made them feel while they were here or if the customer writes something about how we work together as a team to help them that's a big thing for us um so those are always really endearing reviews when you read something through that that's like the the two thumbs up you know we're excited anytime we get a good review we're like awesome but when we get something where the customer goes out of their way to take a couple extra seconds to like write something about 
you know, somebody specific or how a couple people work together to help them. That's where we're like, that's us. That's who we are. So. I mean, it's huge when you compare yeah, this. Yeah, we waste a lot of ink and paper because we'll print like 50 copies of those and like hang them everywhere with like big Sharpie, like you're awesome, you know, and all kinds of fun stuff. And when you do that, you're also incentivizing to other customers who come to your store to like want to join in on that. They also yeah. want to leave reviews. They see it's fun. It's not, oh my God, your Yelp is one of the only dealerships Yelps that isn't just, oh my God, this place sucks. They're terrible. Yeah, our, our, you know what? I'm very proud of our Yelp. I am very proud of it based on all the relationships that I have with different people at different stores who... They just can't, they just can't keep their Yelp above like a one star. <laughs> no. And honestly, I tell people who come to us for like reputation management, if you get above a two stars on Yelp, you're doing something right. Cause everybody just goes there to complain. It's so hard to get people to pull off of that. Does your father respond to all the reviews or is that? No, uh-huh. no he not none, none of them. Uh, okay. He just gets them all. So okay. but I actually used to. Um, I used to, for about a year, a little over a year, probably I responded to every, every review we got every single one. It was me replying. Um, that just became something where it just wasn't, it wasn't possible for me to keep up with them because you, you listed how many we've had. I mean, we get thousands of them. So I mean, every day it was like, you know, 10, 12 of them a day. It's just, it just became something where if I fell behind for two or three days, it's like, a half hour, an hour of time, just going in and responding. And, you know, I'm not just like in a thank you, you know, I actually would reply to the person and try to personalize it. So actually, uh, Sam, our marketing assistant now does that and she's way better at it than I ever was. So it's, it's great. So I just asked her when she started doing, it, I was like, can you please just be personable about these respond to them? Like you're responding yourself and customers may engage with you and, you have any problems or anything becomes negative just get with me i'll take care of it no problem i'll jump in and you know sometimes customers will put a negative review and you know should reply and the customer will want more information or something and i'll just jump in and just give them a quick phone call send them an email you know say hey i'd love to talk with you about this and those are opportunities at the end of the day we look at all of those as opportunities whether it's a good one or a bad one i mean you know at the end of the day we'll we do enough business that we're going to do stuff wrong throughout the day. And that one bad experience that a customer gets, if they're kind enough to bring that to our attention in some way, shape or form, then we're going to have the opportunity to do something about it. If they don't ever bring that to our attention, then, you know, we're out. Casey, that's all I think we have time for today. It was such a good time talking to you. I hope we'll have you back on very soon. Uh, again, please let me know if you need anything. We had a great time talking to you today. Thanks so much, Daniel. It was great to be a part of this. So I'd love to come back sometime. Take care.